Okay. Here we go, our next lecture is about feature engineering. And if you're gonna be doing professional machine learning, you're gonna be doing a lot of feature engineering. You're gonna be going between um, looking at the raw data, doing feature engineering, using that model evaluation and creation process that we talked about with an algorithm like logistic regression that we just learned. And you're gonna be cycling around and through and understanding all of these parts at a pretty deep level will give you the right intuition to end up with a model that's gonna be very successful and achieve your goals in practice. So the goal of this lecture, we're gonna go through a feature engineering overview and talk about what it is, but then we're gonna get into feature engineering with respect to text. And to just give a little aside, you know, as people have used machine learning in lots of different applications over the last decade or two or whatever it is, um, People have developed feature engineering approaches that work well with particular types of data. So in order to become a machine learning expert, you need to understand the algorithms, but you need to also build up the toolkit in the domains that you're going to work on. And we're going to give you an introduction to what that looks like in the text space in this lecture today. And we're going to go through a process in a little bit of detail on how you might iterate on feature engineering and improve and just some of the things you might look at to help you do that a little bit better. And throughout the course, we're going to be spending a lot more time on this iterating and improving. And many of the assignments are about how do you get more and more information out of the modeling process that help you with this iteration and improvement. But today we're going to give a little touch on what that might look like. But let's start with feature engineering. So there's some goals for feature engineering. I think there's four bullets on the slide. And the first is when you're going to use machine learning, remember, we have to take unstructured data and turn it into a feature vector. That's the, the X that your model is able to, your learning algorithm is able to process and is able to interpret and is able to turn into a model that might have a chance of predicting what you're trying to predict. So common cases, you know, you're doing a, your machine learning person, you go to a new place a new project and somebody says hey it might be a nice idea to do some machine learning on this you say well okay well you know if you're a noob what you say is where's the feature vectors because that's sort of saying like who's done somebody's done feature engineering for me you know give me the feature vectors and i'll do machine learning that means you're not very good at it what you're going to say instead is well where's the raw data and the person you're working with is going to be like well we have this log that we've been logging on our application for 10 years, go do feature engineering. Or we got this directory that's full of all the documents that all of our customers have ever produced. Go look at that and do some machine learning. And so, you know, feature engineering is an important first step. Um, there's, there's other things you might want to do. One is, one is called like data cleaning, where you might go to that directory and find out half the files are totally corrupted. That's a very important part of machine learning. We're not going to cover that too much in this class, but just so you know, so you go, you go make sure your data is not total gibberish then you do feature engineering, then you start the machine learning flywheel to get better and better and better and iterate. But in the process of doing this, when you're making these feature engineering decisions, you want to make decisions that take the concept that you're trying to predict, the concept that's in the data, and light it up and expose it. For example, if uh, we're doing our assignments and we're trying to figure out if something is SMS spam, if we did feature engineering and said, you know, how many capital letters are there? How long is the message? And those are the only features we used. It doesn't really highlight the spam nature of what might be going on in a particular text message. If instead we said, hey, let's look for words like, you know, sale, free, offer, credit card, phone numbers, dollar amounts, things like that. Now we've done a much better job of taking the concept of spamness and lifting it out of the raw data in a way that a machine learning algorithm could potentially pick it up. The third goal is that as you're doing feature engineering, you have to realize that each machine learning algorithm is different and you might approach each different concept differently when trying to do machine learning to extract it, but you might also do that in conjunction with, and this is the model that's going to be trying to learn the concept. And what do I know about what parameters the model will create? How the model works with particular types of features? Does it deal with them well or does it deal with them poorly? And the final thing is that, um, well, this is kind of two things into one, but you need to balance the number of features you produce. Remember, we talked about the curse of dimensionality in the last lesson, along with the complexity of the concept. If you're trying to learn something very, very complicated, you're probably going to need more features than if you're trying to learn something simple along with 
the complexity of the model that you're going to produce, how many parameters does it have, and how likely is it to potentially get confused and lost. And we'll get to overfitting and talk about all of what that means, but just, just to plant a seed here. And also the amount of data you have. Because if you have more data, you can afford to have more features and try to learn a more complex concept. If you have very little data and a very complex concept, you know, you may things may be out of whack and then you have to do extra feature engineering to simplify things and to get the model pointed in generally the right direction. And another aspect of this, you know, I said there were kind of two aspects to this last bullet, is that feature engineering results in here's the feature vector, here are the axes. If you do something that has 10 hundred thousand X's and then you have a million training samples, you know, most machine learning algorithms are going to want to load a bunch of that into RAM. But in any case, they're going to need to process them and chug on that data over and over and over and over. So the more features you add, the more runtime you add, and then the slower you make the process of tuning your hyperparameters, tuning the modeling process, checking to see if things generalize. So there is actually a valid um, constraint that you might say like, look, my time is valuable also. And I could go and extract all these features, but that's just going to slow me down and it's not going to be worth it. I could produce more value by chugging through more problems than by doing crazy feature engineering here, creating a bunch of features and sitting around for a long time, interpreting and tweaking and tuning. So anyway, those are the goals of feature engineering to make data in the form that a machine learning algorithm can do it, expose the concept you're trying to learn, do it in a way that the learning algorithm you're working with tends to work well with. And as you know, as we go through more and more learning algorithms, I'll make a point of explaining what they're good at and bad at. And then balance the actual complexity of the concept with the data, with like all of the um, overfitting and underfitting constraints that we're going to talk about in the future. There you go, goals of feature engineering. And so let's just start off with a simple example. Uh, from the SMS spam assignment that we're going to be doing, I mean, hopefully, hopefully you've started it all, on it already. We're a few lectures in, and if you haven't even opened up that file and run, you know, the getting started and maybe the maybe the second assignment, you're probably falling behind. So go get on that. But here is uh, SMS spam. So let's say we have an SMS spam message, which is arbitrary text. And I've gone off and being an expert at spam and an expert at machine learning, I've said, well. I'm going to do some feature engineering and I'm going to do it by coming up with five things that I think will expose the concept. And here they are. Um, one feature for if the message is longer than 40 characters, one feature for if the message contains any digits at all, one feature if it contains the word call to your. So that's you know three features, one for call, one for two, and one for your. And I'll say, well, that's how I'm going to take any SMS spam message and convert it into a five dimensional array of binary features, which I will call X, hand to the learning algorithm, say, produce me a model. So in the case of, here's a particular SMS spam message that you might imagine, and, and we could go through and perform the feature extraction from this text using this feature engineered set of features. And if we did that, we'd say like this first feature is it greater than 40 characters long? Yes, it is. So we would put a one there. Does this have any digits in it? There's some digits, lots and lots and lots of digits. So that would be a one. Does it contain the word call? And you could scan this and look for a while, but I, I think I've looked at it. I'm pretty sure it doesn't contain the word call. Um, contains the word two, contains the word your. So now that is the feature set we've created. And that is what a particular vector would look like. Now, the goal of feature engineering is to do this part here better, more automatically, in ways that have been proven to have success for the types of problems that you're going to be working on. And so we're not just off in the weeds trying to invent like, oh, I think if there's an HTTP there, it could be good. You know, let's, let's be a little bit more systematic and learn what experts have learned over the years for how to approach these sorts of text learning problems. But before we get too far into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's the palette of options that we can deal with. And so, you know, like I think we've said before, there's binary, categorical, numeric. And so you can have features of all of those types, and I'll give you some examples. Does the message contain a particular word? Is the message long? Does the message contain any 
um, number signs or, ha or you know, of these special characters. I wonder if this is a typo here. Um, does the message contain any punctuation? So you could come up with any little simple test and apply it to a message and create a feature. Another type of thing you could do is categorical features. So you could look at the first word in the message and say, what's the part of speech of that first word? You could go look in a lookup table to have every word, what part of speech it is, you know, usually. Maybe you do actually call out to a grammar processing program and say, you know, parse this sentence and tell me the part of speech of the first word. And you could have, you know, these multiple choice options. You could also, instead of just saying, um, is the message long? You could say, well, let's make more thresholds. And so I'll create a categorical feature, one for if the message is like 0 to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 50, 50 or greater, something along those lines. Um, you could look at the token type of the first word or the, the first 10 words or something like that. And you could have, for each of the first 10 words, is it a number, a word, a phone number, unknown, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you could, you could go through um, some fixed number of the words in the SMS spam message and check them for particular things that you might know about, essentially taking one of these and turning it into, um, you know, just like giving it some more options. Um, just like that part of the speech thing, you could do more sophisticated grammar type analysis and you could run a grammar checker. You could say like, um, that's not a sentence. It's a simple sentence that's at an easy reading level, or it's a very long, complicated sentence that has multiple clauses, but it parses well. So whoever wrote this is a pretty good writer, something along those lines. And then you could look at, well, what are numeric features that you might do in this SMS spam domain? Um, instead of like just saying, does it contain a particular word? You could say, well, how many times does it contain that particular word? Because, you know, maybe a spam really, really wants you to call. Maybe it says it four or five or six times in a, in a short, tiny message. You could output the length of the message directly as a number. This is 47 characters long. And then you could rely on, you know, your machine learning algorithm to take 47 and convert it into the appropriate, you know, thresholds. In fact, we'll get to decision trees in a few lectures and decision trees will um, natively do exactly that, convert a number to the right threshold. So you don't have to be part of that process at all. Another thing you could look at is like, well, what's the first number contained in the message? So scan each word until one of them parses as a number, output that number as a feature, um, as, you know, as one of the X's that you hand to your learning algorithm. And then you could take this grammar analysis and break it down into other parts like, you know, what is the reading level or the writing level of the person who wrote this? Okay, anyway, so those are basic feature types that you can use. And of course, if you've come up with a feature that you find to be useful, but um, your model structure, your model type doesn't work well with it, there are easy and obvious conversions that you could do. And I think some of them were pretty clear as I was going through it on the previous slide. May not be too surprising, but if you wanted to take a numeric feature and convert it into a binary feature, well, all you need to do is have a single threshold. So you would have the numeric feature, which is the length of the test, the text plus the particular threshold that you want to use. And that's a simple converter from a numeric feature to a binary feature. You could do numeric feature to categorical feature uh, similarly, except that you'd want to have more thresholds. So, you know, short, medium, greater than 40 is long, something along those lines. Another type of conversion you could do, which is a little bit less obvious, I guess, is you can convert a categorical feature to a set of binary features. So you take one feature, which might say, like here we have this categorical short, medium, or long, and you want to convert it into a set of features that represents the same thing, but all of them are binary so that you can easily input it into something like the logistic regression algorithm that we've seen so far. And the way that you would do that is called one-hot encoding very simple commonly used technique and there you would just say you know if the message is short you would output one zero zero because that would be like this first bit represents is the message short is the message medium is the message long so essentially converting a categorical feature into a bunch of binary features um 
And then if you want to convert a binary feature into a numeric feature, and this one might be the trickiest of all of them, if you want to take a binary feature and convert it into a numeric feature, you just output it, 0, 1, 0, 1. You don't need to do any conversion. Okay, that was a joke, but got you. Maybe I didn't get you. All right, so that's some of the basics, but now let's look at some of the very common and actually quite powerful techniques that have been discovered and are commonly used when doing feature engineering with text. And so we're gonna talk about how do you take the raw text and tokenize it, convert it into tokens, how do you convert those tokens into feature sets, bag of words, and, and this concept of doing n-grams? How do you do a little bit better than binary features by including some notion of how important the word is? And then embeddings is a more recent technique, which is to replace the raw word as a like a zero one token with um, some short vector that represents the meaning of the word. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on each of these. It'll, you know, 10 minutes, whatever it is, but this is, this is how we're going to spend the next chunk of this lecture. Okay. The first technique we're going to talk about for text is called tokenization. And tokenization is the act of taking a raw block of text. So in that first example there, nah, I don't think he goes to USF and turning that into a series of possible features. In this case, if you just tokenize by doing string dot split on white space, you would get these potential features from that block of text. Now, I don't think he goes to USF. And that could be reasonable, it could work, but I'm gonna go through a few things, a few tricks that you might consider doing that would make the concept much simpler by, do, by removing some extraneous, like, things that seem different but aren't really different and replacing some raw tokens with something a little bit smarter or a little bit more semantically meaningful and all of these things are going to seem quite simple but they're an example um uh, you know i think it's a good example to walk through of what would i like to do as part of feature engineering to make the concept easier for the machine learning algorithm to see you know one way to think about it in text so one thing you might want to think about is do I really want to just break on white space and leave all the punctuation in wherever the punctuation happens to be? Because you might see like you have this word na comma, which is na appearing at the beginning of a sentence, but you might instead say, well, that comma is actually a separate thing. So I'd like to break that on a change between an alphanumeric character and some other type of character. So I, instead of breaking everywhere there's a white space, I would break everywhere the type of character changes. And that would result in two potential tokens here instead of one, which is na and a comma. Another way to think about it is that a comma doesn't really mean anything. You know, what does knowing that there was a comma in a sentence gonna tell logistic regression? Like what weight should logistic regression put on a comma? It doesn't seem super correlated with this concept of spamminess. So that might be a place where we just say like, look, strip the punctuation, break on white space and then strip out every punctuation character and then just end up with this token of na, which would be like, hey, you know what? If I say na at the beginning of a sentence or na at the middle of a sentence or na at the end of a sentence, all of those things are pretty much the same. So let's just output the same token for all of those situations, leave the punctuation out. But you might have to be a little bit careful what you do because if you make a decision about how to deal with punctuation, just by looking at this one example of punctuation with na, you might forget that punctuation is used for other things too. For example, there are words that contain punctuation in them, this don't. And now like if we ignored punctuation and just output tokens, that might be the right thing where we would have outputted the token don't. So na and don't, you know, doing better on one might potentially do worse on the other. Um, if we use this like this technique, we would have don, don as a token, apostrophe as a token, and t as a token, just t in isolation. Um, the other thing is if you use this technique of totally stripping punctuation and not even worrying about it, you might end up with something like this, don and t as features. Um, one common thing to do is to apply a little bit of, um, in well, common thing to do in text learning is to apply a little bit of human knowledge to what's actually going on here and replacing don't with the tokens D, O, and then an apostrophe T. And those contain the notions that it's a do and the negation of the do. And so if you kind of keep them together, 
and then and this might also apply to can't cannot it's like a contraction but it, it kind of breaks the contraction but leaves in the notion that it started out as a contraction because you know like an, another thing you could potentially do is replace this by the features do comma not which is you know you interpreting that don't and turning it into the two tokens that it's actually trying to be or it's actually representing so okay these are these are options for what to do and the right answer might depend on the shape of the concept that you're trying to model. Maybe this, you know, if you're if you're really trying to understand, well, what's the the um, the sentiment in this sentence, or what's the deeper meaning? You may need to capture all these nuances. If you're just looking for spam, you know, maybe the spammer just puts a whole bunch of garbage there, and all of this is too subtle. And so then you would choose the thing that creates the fewest number of features, and be like, eh, bah. maybe there's an extra 0.001 percent of accuracy if I did better on that. But I got other things to do in my life. Let's do the simplest thing and move on. And in this case, I, I imagine the simplest thing that would do both of these well, you know, maybe I'd pick something like that, you know, like what the heck. So there's a T as a feature. Who cares? There's going to be a weight on it. It's probably going to be small. It doesn't matter. And another thing you might consider doing when dealing with text is to normalize the text. And that is take all that inf extra information about what case the text is in and throw it away. So, you know, it's a simple way of saying, convert everything to lowercase. Now, normalization is something that uh, could work well with text because really the, the difference between this and this, all that means is that this word is either a proper name or it's at the beginning of the sentence or something else weird is going on. And maybe knowing that a particular word tends to occur or did occur at the beginning of a particular message isn't relevant to whether or not that message is spam. And in fact, it, it makes it a lot harder. Essentially, you need to see each word. I mean, it just creates extra contexts where a word might show up um, and just requires a lot more data to learn what to do with that word, particularly you know, when it occurs first in a sentence, because you probably won't see that very often. And another way to say that is that you will create a lot of features that have very little data for you to figure out what the right weight to put is for that feature in your logistic regression model, which is what we're doing in the assignment now. And the result of that will be that you will have unstable estimates of what the weight is for that word at the beginning of a sentence. And it'll be just like create some problems with your model's ability to learn a concept that's going to generalize well. So normalization can often help with that part of the problem. Um, normalization doesn't just apply to text. We'll see in a few slides how we can apply normalization to to numeric data which removes kind of like differences that don't really matter <clears throat> another form of normalization you could think about is to take something like this particular string of characters and be like look it doesn't really matter if the characters are 1425 or 1427 or 1422 or whatever the heck it happens to be what matters is that hey there's a number here and another way to think about it is that if you're going to have a separate token for every possible number that you might see in an SMS spam message, the number like 77 may only appear in one message in your training data. That makes it very hard to know what to do with that particular token. So instead of trying to deal with each individual number separately and say, well, what does 14 have to do with spamminess or what does 92 have to do with spamminess? You might just say, what does the fact that there's a number at all have to do with spamminess. And that might be a much more predictive feature. Now again, you know, we talked about different ways you could encode this and you could instead normalize this as, hey, there was a small number. Hey, there was a big number. Hey, there was something that like tends to occur in a phone number, you know, or an area code, like a common area code number. Or you could you could get a little bit more fancy, but let's just keep it simple and say, you know, standard thing to do when you come to a text is just apply few of these straightforward normalizations as a starting point. Okay, so there's a lot of options here. Um, and let's just quickly go through some tips for saying, well, where do I start? How do I get into the right ballpark before I go off chasing my tail with this optimization loop that we're gonna talk about? Um, and the idea is like, if you have really a lot of data, a complicated model structure, a complicated concept, you can do a lot of optimization keep as much information as you can. Maybe do, you know, the raw thing or, or uh, you know, do, do this thing here and maybe keep the raw numbers, something along those lines. Because 
hey, there's a ton of data. It's unlikely that if you know the number 77 will only occur once, maybe the number 77 will occur a thousand times in your data set, and you can start to figure out, well, you know, 77, um, the model will start to figure out, well, hey, that's a small number that tends to be the price of the type of things that spammers are trying to sell, so that's a good thing to put weight on. So if there's a lot of data, don't waste your time doing tokenization and thinking too hard. Let the computer waste its time, assuming that the modeling process doesn't take too long and you, know, you can afford to give the computer the time to do the work. But if you don't have much data or you can't do much optimization or you know, the, the concept, maybe you do have sort of a lot of data, but the concept is actually really much more complicated than the data you have available. Or maybe you need to learn a simple model structure like logistic regression, but you know the concept is actually a lot more sophisticated. Well, then it makes sense to invest more human effort in normalizing the features, make them much more easy for the uh, for the learning algorithm to interpret. You do the work so that it can focus its capacity on the parts of the problem that humans wouldn't really know how to think about. like hey, here's 100,000 words which we need to jointly balance and figure out what a consistent set of weights are to do the best job of separating spam from not spam. Computer's good at that. Computer isn't good at figuring out that you know particular types of numbers, which it only has a few observations of, may mean something. I mean, you, you know more because you're a human, you have a brain, you've been living your whole life, you kind of have a lot of context. So try to encode some of that context through the tokenization process when you don't have enough data or optimization or model power to let the computer do it for you. And then the other thing that you really do want to do is that um, focus what features you produce on the concept. That was the second. <clears throat> Let's just go back to this bullet. I, I stopped and paused. Let's just do this one again. So here we go. And the other thing, you know, I've, I've sort of said it several ways, but oh, let me get my head out of the way there. Oh, look at that. these buttons down here. They're so cool. Here, look, I got this. Uh, here, can you see? I got this thing. I can press the button like and make me. Yeah, there you go. So anyway, you want to focus your features on things that are relevant to the concept that make the concept pop. And, you know, we'll talk a lot more about this when we get to overfitting and underfitting. But, you know, it's just a, a simple thing to think about is that if you expose features that are totally unrelated to the concept you're trying to learn. Occasionally, they're going to trick your learning algorithm into thinking they are important. And so if you know something is not relevant, take it out. Don't give the machine learning the algorithm the task of like figuring out that, hey, that thing doesn't have anything to do with it. Or, oh, shucks, you know, by, by chance it looked good, so I learned a model that's completely sort of crazy. Okay, so that's tokenization. So we can take any block of text and turn it into a bunch of tokens, which are potential kind of like proto features or things we might like to make into features in one sense or another. Now, the next question you might ask is, well, well what should those features be? You know, and it, it's simple to say, well, we can have a binary feature for a particular token. And that's kind of where we're heading and bag of words we're talk about that. But we're going to see first this bag of word technique, then we're going to see a couple other techniques, how you might do something a little bit different and take a token and not turn it directly into a zero one feature. But let's just give a quick example for bag of words. And that's just a technique. Essentially what it says is bag of words is take every token that you've seen in any message in your training data, not in your test data, not in your validation data, just in the training data. Remember those, those other sets don't use them at all in the like, what should the model be process. Don't use them at all in feature engineering process. If you can help it, training data. So we take every token in the training data, throw it into a big bag. That's a bag of all the words that you have in the universe of things that you know about. And each of those words turns into a feature. And so just like a quick illustration of that, you know, here's all the words that occurred across all those four messages. And you can see some of them are sort of duplicated. Some of them are only appear in one of those messages, I think. I didn't quite test it through, but basically it'd say for anything that's in that bag of words, all the words that occurred in your training data, that's the bag, the bag of words, you're gonna produce a feature. So in this case, that works out to, oh, well, I mean, that's like, there you go, you can see features, but you'd rather look at me than that. <laughs> at least my mother would, I don't know. So you have, these are the features that you produce using the bag of words technique which is tokenize everything, everything that comes up with a token turns into a feature. 
one feature per unique token in the training data. So let's just go through that example in a little bit more excruciating detail. <clears throat> so here are the selected features from this training set. Then we could say for message one, you know, message one, because these are the features we've created, each message has 10 um, dimensions, 10 components to its X vector, to its feature vector. X1 represents the word A occurred in that message. So in M1, you know, A appeared there. I guess we've done normalization. <laughs> so we'd say one um, word, word occurs there. So we'd say one of, oh, this one's pretty easy, of text. So it looks like we did normalization where we remove punctuation. Good to know. And then the rest of these would all be zero, 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 zero. And so that's how we would turn, use bag of words to turn that training data into a training set. And this would be the input to logistic regression. Now, at test time or validation time, you might have some other message. And the message might be some, C, some features for a test example. So now we would have to turn this into a feature vector using this exact same mapping that we produced at training time. You don't want to introduce any new features or anything along those lines. So we'd say some, so the first word is A. This guy definitely contains A. Word, no, of, looks like a no. Text, yes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll just erase this and click my magic button. And so the vector, the X vector, the features for that example would be this. And now notice that um, there's a word here, example, which wasn't in the initial bag of words. And so it didn't become a feature. And so there's no like X11, for example, that's just gone. It's called out of vocabulary. And that just means that you probably wanted more training data because if you're seeing a lot of tokens in your test data that you never saw at training time, that means you probably didn't have a representative sample of what you're trying to learn and you might want to think about what you're doing. Um, maybe the uh, complexity of the feature space, the complexity of the problem is greater than the amount of data you have. Thing in text is that there are a lot of words in languages. And so no matter how much training data you have, you're always going to bump into out of vocabulary words. And it's sort of okay. You know, maybe it's a misspelling that, you know, a unique misspelling that nobody's ever done before. But the, the point is like, Having some out of vocabulary is okay if you know why it's happening because you know English is very big and some of these like very infrequently wor used words aren't that important. In other cases, being out of vocabulary um, could be a very big problem for what you're trying to do. Like if you're in a specific subdomain where you're trying to learn something about a programming language and a programming language token shouldn't be out of vocabulary, something along those lines. Anyway, there you go. That's a quick little example. And you know, when should you use bag of words? Well, if you have a lot of data. You can use many features like you can with logistic regression. Uh, doing something like bag of words is it's pretty simple. You just do tokenization with maybe a tiny bit of normalization, throw every token you see in the training data in and run with it. And we'll see in the next lecture when we get to feature selection, how to refine that, you know, which is a pretty important step is to do some feature selection for refinement. But you know, simple thing to do, simple thing to try, great baseline. If you don't know where to start, do a bag of words. Okay, bag of words is very simple, but Bag of words actually throws away a lot of information. In particular, you know, sentences are written in an order for a reason. You read them from left to right, or in some languages, right to left or top to left, but you read them in an order. Human languages have that sequence, and the sequence has some meaning to it. Um, they also have words that take different meanings depending on the context of what's going on around them. And here's an example of that. Down the bank generally would mean I'm going down the bank into the river. From the bank generally might mean I am getting some money out of the bank, out of my bank account. Maybe not from the bank could mean I picked something up off the bank of the river. So, you know, like maybe even this amount of context isn't enough. And the point is that many languages have a lot of subtlety and depth and are pretty hard to interpret one thing at a time. Um, but these simple text processing techniques have proven to be quite effective, even throwing away a lot of this information in this context that you might think, oh, that could be important, but maybe not. But n-grams is a way to put back a little bit of that context 
as opposed to just doing a bag of words where you throw away 100% of the context. And, you know, it's pretty simple. The idea is that you just take if, you know, n is a variable. So if you were going to have two grams, that would mean that you take every series of two tokens and turn that into a token. So, you know, text fa, fa2, two with the number. So like here they are, text fa, fa2, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Looks like there's a little bug. There should be two number, something along those lines as a feature right there. Oh, terrible, it's a bug, I don't know. But so then you would look at a particular message and say, well, what is, what's the feature vector for message two? It has, you know, does it contain the token na i? It does not. Does it contain the token I don't? It does not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start to get to these places where you see the token. So what this does is it introduces a lot of sparsity in that, you know, in order to have a feature match, you have to have exactly the right two tokens in exactly the right order. But on the other hand, it allows you to keep a little bit more information. Like when we were talking about do and then the n comma t, if we were doing two grams, those would turn into a single token. And so the meaning of, of, of that pair of words as a pair would be what the machine learning algorithm was trying to process versus dealing with them separately. And, you know, it's pretty clear that, you know, on the last one we said use it with a lot of data, but that lot was in lowercase and many features, but the many was in lowercase. But now, you know, if you have really a lot of data and you have a very complicated concept and you have a lot of time to process, it's often useful to use two grams, three grams. One common pattern might be that you put all bag of word features, all two gram features, and all three gram features as potential features, and then do some feature selection and then go from there. And so by the end of the next lecture, you'll have all the tools to be able to do that. For now, for um, SMS spam, I believe that we only ever do bag of words in any of the assignments. And basically that's just to keep the runtime down. And because you know we have several thousand training samples, and several thousand pieces of text is really not nearly enough, I don't think, to do two grams. You would just have too much sparsity. Although now that I think about it, I'll admit I haven't tried it. If one of you wants to try it and let me know I'm wrong, I'd be delighted to be wrong. But Okay, so you might say, hey, all this token stuff, it's great, but it's a little bit confusing. I just want to do something even simpler and something you could try then is n-grams with characters instead of with tokens. So. If you were doing that, you would say, well, let's not even bother breaking on white space. Let's just take the first two characters, N, A, and create a feature for the character N followed by the character A. Take the next two features, A, H, the character A followed by, then H space, character H followed by the character space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you were gonna look at doing things like um, two grams plus three grams plus four grams, then maybe there would be fewer features in the union of these three sets than you would have if you do things with tokens. And if you look at a foregram, you know, like the word goes, I mean, that foregram covers that. Um, he, G, O, or he space G, you know, it get captures the he, it captures a little bit of the context of what the next word might be. Um, even if you have a longer word like receive, you might have the feature R-E-C-E-I, and that series of characters doesn't occur in maybe too many words. So you may actually have the word, you know, captured in your training data just through these n-grams instead of through tokens. So you could potentially try something like bag of words plus two grams at the token level plus three grams at the character level, create a feature set about all of those things, throw it in and see what happens, of course, with some feature selection. So this n-grams approach can actually be very helpful with this out of dictionary pro uh, problem. And like one way to think about it is like, let's say you get the Reuters corpus, which is like all the news stories written by Reuters over the last n years, whatever it is. And you do a bag of words on that, then you get like, any other text corpus, like all the novels written in the last 50 years. The set of words used in those two, there's gonna be a whole bunch of out of dictionary words in either direction. And those might come from, hey, spelling mistakes. Both of those sources were edited, but mistakes got through. It may just come from the fact that, you know, like the way language is used has changed a little bit over time or different things tend to be used in news speak that aren't used in novel speak, but, um, these slight 
tweaks to words and tweaks to spellings might show up in the engram. So you may have more hits, you know, I mean, you'll certainly have more hits across the dictionaries and the, um, the feature sets, and those hits may actually be semantically meaningful, particularly in the case of spelling mistakes. You know, one character spelling mistake doesn't change the meaning, it's just like an error or some noise in your data. Um, right, so fixed number of features for a given n. So, you know, two grams, that's 26 times 26 possible features for the, you know, the two characters. So it's a, it could be a large number, but it's a lot smaller than every word in the dictionary. Okay, so those last few techniques, tokenization, bag of word, engrams, character engrams, those are about how to take um, the things that appear in the document and have binary features for like, did that occur or not? But sometimes you can do better without even getting to the training stuff. You can include in the feature some notion of how important that word is or how predictive or how unexpected that word is. Because I, you might've seen in some of the examples, the word to appears everywhere. Having the word to in a message is not hyper predictive of really maybe anything, but having a slightly more domain specific word might be very predictive. Anyway, one simple technique that's commonly used in information retrieval is to do the um, TFIDF score of the word rather than do the presence of the word and have that be the feature that you output. So that stands for the term frequency times the inverse document frequency. So instead of using a binary count a uh, binary feature contains word, whatever the term is, use the numeric importance score of the word to the message and the corpus. The corpus, I've used that word twice now. Now corpus is a common term for the set of text documents that you've processed to create your features. So that's a sort of a specific to um, text processing, although it spills over a little bit, but if you're dealing with text, people are gonna say corpus, 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 corpus. That's all the documents that you process to create the features that you're gonna use. So you'd say, use a numeric importance score of the term to the particular message and the term to the corpus. So you would say the term frequency is the percent of words in the document that are term. And it would be like, how important is this particular term to the document? So if the word like sale appears three times, you would say, well, sale isn't just a binary, it was there. You'd say sale is actually important to this document. So let's give that a higher score for this particular document. But you would then balance that by the notion that um, the uh, inverse document frequency, which is the number of documents in your corpus or the number of documents in your training set divided by the number of documents that contain the term. So if there was just one spammer who was trying to sell like some antivirus product with a particular name versus every message containing the word to, you might wanna handle those two things differently. Here's the little math to it. And, and if you plot that, you would see on the X axis, the percent of documents containing the term and on the Y axis is the inverse document frequency score. So if 100% of the documents in your training set, 100% of the SMS spams in your training set contain a particular term, then the inverse document frequency score for that is zero. Whereas if like a very small fraction of the documents in your corpus contain it, then you're getting a higher and higher score, maybe like one, two, three, four, five. I mean, as you get closer to zero, you get possibly quite large. And to just say it one more time, the term frequency in the document is the importance of the term to the document. The inverse document frequency is the important, like kind of the novelty across the corpus and you would multiply those together, right? Like, so you'd be term frequency times inverse document frequency equals the score. And here you would see like, if we were to take this as the corpus, those two messages, B-O-W, fancy term, bag of words. So that's just like the technique we talked about before, every token just gets a zero one binary feature versus the TFIDF score then you would see um, message two's features under the bag of words approach would be 0001, 011111. Um, the same thing under the TFIDF approach would be like point, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.99. So in some sense it doesn't, you know, like in this small toy example, 
it kind of doesn't really make a difference because, you know, if you're thinking, well, logistic regression would just scale the weight so that those things would look the same. But then there is this one particular one where, you know, this word two occurs in every single document. That's a bit extreme of an example, but you would see that that would start to get downweighted as, um, you know, if there were a lot more documents in the corpus, it wouldn't be exactly set to zero, but it would be downweighted and pushed towards a smaller and smaller number. And so TFIDF is the type of thing where you would say like, yeah, I'm gonna do bag of words with some character engrams and I'm gonna do TFIDF across the board instead of just outputting the raw binary presence. And that might be a decent starting point if you were gonna explore some you know, text learning, text machine learning with text type applications. Okay, so those are some quite traditional techniques. A slightly more modern technique, which is becoming a little bit traditional also, is to use word embeddings. And two common things as of a few years ago for that are called word to vec, word to vector is what that means, and fast text, which I think is Facebook's version of word to vec. And at a mechanical level, what you would do is you'd go look up, you'd go download these gigantic lookup tables. And for with a lookup table, you take a particular token and you stick the token into the lookup table and it comes back with a vector. And you know, in the in my example here, I just have a two-dimensional vector space, but with an embedding, traditionally you'd have a higher dimensional vector space. But let's just look at the two-dimensional version here. And the coordinates in that space are related heavily to the meaning of the word. So you take a word, you look it up in the embedding table, it spits out a vector. When you plot that vector, you find regions that have very similar meanings. So right here in this example, you know, when you're in this region, you see a lot of different words related to colors. And when you're in this region, you see a lot of different words related to animals. And maybe um, in this region, you see a lot of words related to food. And maybe there's a little bit of an overlap between those regions or something along those lines. And maybe in this region, you see words that are related to marketing or advertising or something along those lines. And um, I won't go into too much detail about how these things are produced, but um, when we get through the uh, neural network portion of the class, I think you'll have enough tools to have a sense of how to go and create your own embedding lookup table and what it's actually trying to do. But for now, this is just to give another example um, to introduce some words and some terms for people who are doing learning with text might talk about these things and it's a very common and important technique. And then instead of putting the raw word in as a feature, you might put in the um, location in this n-dimensional vector space. And you could do that like by creating a, um, oh, let's just uh, try to rewind past where I put that thing in. And so to, you could replace, instead of, <clears throat> okay, we're gonna pop, 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 it's gonna be, so instead of inputting the raw word as a feature, you might input something about where in this embedding space did the word appear. And so in that sense, you've gone from a token, which your machine learning algorithm needs to kind of get a sense of what it means, to having a meaning. And your machine learning algorithm can learn, well, how important is that meaning to the concept I'm trying to do? So you just basically, it's another way of like normalization or removing differences that aren't important, which is like, put the actual meaning of the word in as a feature. Don't put the identity of the word in as a feature. And then, you know, like, we have to take the n-dimensional feature space and turn it into, you know, what what's the input gonna be? And you could like bin this up into regions and then say, hey, did it have something from that region? Or, you know, how many things did it have from that region? Or what's the average vector across all of the words, you know, if you take all the words in the thing and, you know, maybe a lot of the words came from this region and a few came from that region. So when you take their average, you're kind of kind of close to this marketing related term region, something along those lines. Um, and this is commonly used with neural networks. And you'll often, you might heard, hear this as um, replacing the words with their meaning or taking a sparse representation and replacing it with a dense representation. And what that means is the um, bag of words representation is sparse because for any particular word that you want to consider using as input, you'll have, here's the full vocabulary that you've learned, which is like every feature that you're considering. And any particular word will just be a one in one spot and a zero everywhere else. So 
the way to think of, hey, here's a particular word in my bag of words, that's a very sparse concept. And instead you want to replace it with a dense concept. So let's say we are doing this two-dimensional embedding, it would be like 0 0.7, 0 0.2. So you'd go from, a, let's say you have a thousand features, each word is a, like a, a one-hot encoding in a thousand-dimensional space, very sparse, to being each word is a kind of like dense encoding in a two-dimensional space. And so you just make things that make it much easier for your machine learning algorithm to make progress. But if you're walking away from this slide, there's a lot of, this is one of those places where I, I let a few advanced topics slip into the discourse, which I know you don't quite have the context for yet, but I'm trying to stretch your understanding a little bit. So when we get to later parts of the course, you'll be like, oh yeah, I see how those things go together. And all of this is a way to say like, this slide is just for the concept. It's just to stretch your brain. It's not, you don't have to like know how to do an embedding in order to pass the tests and that sort of stuff. But the thing to take away with this is you can replace words with their meanings by using this kind of like embedding lookup table thing. Now I just want to give you one more quick technique and another example of normalization, which is very commonly done. Like let's say you are taking the length of the message and you want to input that as a feature. Now, remember that logistic regression is going to learn a, um, a weight for that feature value. So it might learn 0.7 times the length of the message and then add that with everything else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you could see that having these kind of like large values as inputs there could really skew stuff up because if all your other features are binary, essentially like zero or one, then this weight here compared to the weight that you would want to multiply times something that's a zero or a one, um, it might be a pretty heavy lift for your logistic regression algorithm to get all the weights calibrated and figure out, oh, for feature 47, I need a very, very, very small weight, but for feature 92, I need actually kind of a big weight. And so normalization is a technique that can make that job much easier by removing the problem from the logistic regression and doing it upstream because it's just such a common thing to do. Logistic regression could do it, given enough data, enough computation, but let's make the job simpler. So you could look at these message lengths, for example, and say, well, hey, the mean is 74.8, blah, blah, blah. So let's not give the learning algorithm this raw number. Let's subtract the mean from each number before we create the feature vector. But that's one step, and that certainly makes the job of the machine learning algorithm easier because it kind of knows what the average value is from the feature, and it doesn't have to try to figure out what's the average value. But we can go one step further. We can calculate the standard deviation of all of these things, and, and in one or two lectures we'll go through how to do that, but you, know, you can just find a library. It's pretty easy. Um, but anyway, you take this mean normalized data and now divide by the standard deviation. And you'd come up with numbers like this. And so you could see that like this negative 1.31 now means something very specific. It means that the value there is negative, so it's less than the mean, and now we know how far below the mean it is. It's over one standard deviation below the mean. So that means it's a pretty small value in the scheme of this data set versus all of these other ones that are like 0 0.02, 0 0.2, 0 0.07. Those are messages that are pretty darn close to the mean. Maybe they're a little bit over it or a little bit under it, but that doesn't matter too much. And now if you think of a logistic regression learning a weight, you could see how the weight would have to encode much less to capture something actually quite interesting. Like, hey, here's a message, you know, like if... As the message gets much, much longer than the average, that would add more weight, which would tend to make something seem more spammy. Okay, and why would you want to do this? Normalization, just like in text, you can help make the machine learning algorithm's job easier. And I think this is a pretty clear example of, you know, what you know about logistic regression right now. You could see how doing this type of transformation would make it significantly easier for logistic regression to figure out how to incorporate numeric features with binary features. Now you don't have to implement numeric features for logistic regression for any of the assignments, but this is just like, you know, if you were going to do in practice anything, 
with logistic regression you want to normalize. But that's not the case for everything. Some model types do a pretty good job of dealing with numeric features without requiring you to normalize. The very next one that we're going to talk about, decision trees, is an example where the model itself learns thresholds that are predictive and it doesn't really care. So you can normalize for a decision tree, but to some degree you're, you're slightly wasting your time and you're making things more complicated and harder to interpret on the downstream side or you know, arguably harder to interpret. But when you're doing like regression, logistic regression, probably want to normalize numeric features. <clears throat> and then to use it in practice, it just requires a little bit of extra work and telling you this just as another example separate your usage of training data from your usage of validation and test data. And in this case, you want to estimate the mean and standard deviation just on your training samples. You don't want to use the validation and the test data to estimate the mean and the standard deviation. But it also means that the estimates of the mean and standard deviation for each feature become part of the model that you need to ship when you ship your model. Because you want to say, when you see a new sample in practice and you're trying to imply my model, well, here's the normalization parameters I used at training time to create feature number 42. You need to bring those along with you because at runtime, you won't have the information to do the same normalization unless you carry those on with you. So yeah, you need to, you need to store them and pass them around. And that's a slight complexity, but it's generically worth it. So there were some techniques for doing feature engineering that allow you to take raw blocks of text and turn them into interesting feature vectors. So when you approach a new problem, you're going to want to take some of those techniques and apply them. You're probably not going to want to take all of them and, and apply them because there's a lot of them and you could spend a month implementing. I mean, you'd get a library and the library would do it for you. But even when it's easy, one thing to know about machine learning is that you don't want to throw the kitchen sink at a problem right from the get-go. It's often better to get your end-to-end -end going, to do a few runs, and then to look at what's going on and let your intuition and the measurements that you're taking guide you towards success. Not only will it end up generally with something that is more efficient and you're not doing a bunch of extra processing that you don't need, but you will often end up with higher quality because it allows you to make good decisions every step along the way. So now you've, so you try something simple, you build a model, you evaluate on the validation data, and then you're like, well, what the heck is going on? You could see the mistakes that your model's making in the validation data. Start to look at them and say, could those mistakes have come from some sort of problem? Like maybe the um, URLs are encoded and you didn't realize that, so you didn't unencode URLs, so all of your tokens are just sort of gibberish in the URL space. So you need to go back and say like, oh, I need to de-encode these and do a little bit of normalization or something like that. Bugs is a very, very common source of problem. It's 100% guaranteed. If you're working with data from a log, whoever wrote that code to log that data had a bug in it absolutely guaranteed <laughs> you're going to have like 1% of your data the record is half missing or 1% of your data these three fields are always two which has nothing to do with anything but it's just like something crashed when that log data was being sent but there's going to be bugs it's going to be weird stuff when you look at the mistakes you're going to you're going to find some bugs and you're going to want to have to say well for records that have a bug what should i do should i throw away that data should i somehow have an extra feature that says there was a bug there and let the learning algorithm know that it should interpret everything else separately. Should I have a separate model for features that have, or for, you know, for row, for instances, for training samples, for problems that had bugs in them and those that didn't? Any of these things is possible. And the way you'd know is by like looking at it and understanding how widely distributed it is and how bad those errors seem to be. Another thing you could try, you could try to get the bug fixed. But that doesn't always help you because a lot of times you might have years of data logged that had a bug present. And those years of data are extremely valuable. And you're going to want to extract what you can out of those. So you'll often bump into this case where you're like, I got to deal with that bug, even though maybe I can get it fixed. Maybe there's an engineer who's willing to touch that code for me, which is like, eh. but even in, you know, 
number one, you don't want to throw away all that old data. And number two, even if you change it today, it'll be months before it's deployed and months after that before you get more data. I mean, maybe your situation is different, but it's just, it's something to think about. Missing values is sort of like a bug too, and just like raw data corruption. So you might look at your mistakes and be like, okay, that's what's going on. The other thing that you might look at, you might look at the mistakes and be like, whoever labeled this was just like wrong. I don't know what they were smoking, but this thing right here is not a ham. That is definitely a spam message. I don't know why that's a ham. And we'll talk in a later lecture about like, labels don't just kind of plop out of the sky. Every label was generated by some process. Sometimes the process will involve looking at how a user interacted with a product and the label will be sort of an implicit outcome of the interactions, like the user did buy that, the user didn't buy that. Other times the labels will come from, like you've shipped off a wad of data to some poor person and that person sat around and said, that's a spam, that's a ham, that's a spam, that's a ham. And you know, it could be miserable. So we'll talk more about that process, but when you're getting into your machine learning at this point, you might say like, look, I'm only 98% accurate. I need to do feature engineering. No, not necessarily. You may be 98% accurate because 2% of the data has noise on the labels. So just make sure you don't chase your tail. Make sure you know where the errors are coming from before engaging in doing more and more complicated feature engineering. Yes. And then now, you know, once you've eliminated those extraneous sources of problems and mistakes, now you could start to say, okay, the mistakes that are left over are probably because feature engineering was wrong. I chose the wrong model type. I set the wrong model hyperparameters. I didn't give enough data or time or optimization or something along those lines. And, and this is where the interesting and fun part of machine learning can begin. So, one thing to do is once you've narrowed them down to like, these are probably modeling mistakes, you want to go and examine them and categorize them. And one, you, do, you don't want to look at everything. And, and like, this is a case where you need to train on the training data and then validate on the validation data. And then once you go and kind of look at your mistakes on the validation data, you've now reduced the benefit of the validation data for future tuning and for because now you've sort of cheated you've really gone and and a fine grain took some time to understand for this particular data this is why i'm making a mistake i'm going to go update the modeling process and then i'm going to learn a new model on the training data and then i'm going to come back to the same validation data and say did i fix that problem that i identified by looking at you so you have to be a little bit careful when you explore mistakes maybe even to the point of like reserving even another little subset of your training set for the mistake tuning part of the process and then saving validation for the hyperparameter correction and then saving the test data for the generalization testing that we're going to talk about but i, I just want to continually give this as a preamble to be like every time you look at data think about how you are taking away a future tool that you might want to use Right? Like by looking at this validation data, you are taking away some of the benefit of that as a tool to the hyperparameter tuning that you're going to need to do. Just be careful. Um, everything's, everything's a balance. I'd say in practice, most machine learning professionals I see look willy nilly at anything they want to look at and just do whatever they feel like doing. But the good ones don't do that. The good ones really understand what they're giving up and they're very intentional about where they look and what decisions they make. Anyway, in some sense, you're going to want to, you know, like that discussion aside, you're going to want to do the right thing with respect to that, but you're going to want to explore the mistakes that your modeling process, the combination of feature engineering and model learning are creating. And one good way to do that is that you would look at n random false positives and n random false negatives and somehow categorize them. <clears throat> and the categorization is kind of a, you know, you can be a little exploratory, like look at five or 10 or 15 or 20 or some number of false positives and be like, what do these have in common? Why do I think my model is getting confused? And you could, you know, some are label noise. Some is because, oh, the words being used are slang and they're very uncommon. They look like some specific slang that a regional 
group of people might use. So in some sense, maybe those are out of vocabulary words in the training set. <clears throat> okay. We've talked about some techniques for how to normalize things or how to deal with that. You know, maybe, maybe, um, Maybe you might want to apply one of those terms. Another that it, some of them might be non-English, and you could say, oh, geez, 3% of our users are Spanish speakers, and 97% are English speakers. And so doing all of these techniques that we've talked about with the data being so heavily kind of skewed towards English speakers mean that the, the weights on these Spanish speakers' messages are very, very, very small in the logistic regression model what would you do then? Maybe you would split that into two problems. Maybe you would, uh, you know, go get more Spanish data. There's a lot of options, but the point is you need to know what a problem is before you can go fix it. And blindly tweaking n grams, two grams, four grams, 32 grams, um, when the real problem is that, you know, the mistakes you're making are all on German messages might not be the right way to go. <clears throat> Another thing that you would commonly like to do is examine the worst false positives and the worst false negatives. And the worst in the sense of like, the model predicts very near one, like 99.9% .9 is the output from logistic regression after the sigmoid application, you're getting 0.99999, but the true answer is zero. So the, the, the training samples that contribute the most to the loss is another way to look at it. Um, you know, and then the other case is, is the dual of that. And often in these like really, really, really wrong messages, you'll find things like data bugs or corruption or just like, oh yeah, duh type problems. Because generally, you know, generally there wouldn't be things that you're so notoriously confused on. Another thing that you might find by looking at this type of messages like, ooh, that spammer's really sneaky. <laughs> like that spammer's doing something that I didn't, man, ooh, that guy is smart. So these are good things to look at to help you. And then, and then when you say, oh, that spammer is really smart, you might say, well, because that spammer is smart and that's a technique that a lot of spammers are using, I'm going to create feature X, which is, you know, blah, 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 some kind of heuristic. I'm writing behind my head. Some kind of heuristic, that didn't help, to detect whatever the trick the spammer happens to be doing is. So, um, and the, the reason I'm, you know, just belaboring this, belaboring this, belaboring this, belaboring this is that Machine learning is an iterative process and you have to like get good information at each point in the process and use it wisely and um, really take the core insight that you discover through this exploring the mistakes process, figure out how to express it in a way that will generalize well and that your machine learning algorithm can pick up and not create a bunch of brittle things that the machine learning algorithm like just only really work for that particular sample, for that particular instance of the mistake. You want to like look across a bunch of your data, take a step back and be like, ah. And let's just go through that one more time, walk through what that process might look like. So you would start, if you come to some new text processing problem, you would start with the standard for your domain. And what I mean by domain is text processing versus computer vision versus whatever else domain you happen to be in. Go learn the equivalent techniques to what we've talked about here. And you'd start with the standard one. So in this case, you'd tokenize, break on white space, maybe strip, pump, strip punctuation, break on white space, do bag of words, maybe also add in two grams at the word level, something like that, that's basic. But you would do it in a way where you have one parameter per 10 samples. What does that mean? <clears throat> Just think of like, if this were a test question, do you understand what those words mean and, and know kind of what that one parameter is? So I'll just give a quick explanation. So it, with logistic regression for each feature, you have one parameter, which would be the weight. And each sample, this is another word for training data. So you would have one feature per about 10 training samples would be a good amount so that in general, the um, logistic regression algorithm can learn what to do with each of those features. But it's just a starting point. Then the next thing you'd want to do is try um, all the important variations and evaluate on the validation set. So if the very first thing that you tried gets your accuracy high enough, you might just say, hey, I'm done and move on, but you probably would want to tweak, you know, take, um, take n grams from two to three and see what happens. 
take um, the tokenization and try one of the other settings and see, see what happens. And if the accuracy on the validation set tends to be highly sensitive to tweaking one of those things, you might want to go figure out why and explore further and, and, and consider doing additional, more advanced feature engineering along whatever dimension you discover the sensitivity of. Then you might want to go and look at your mistakes. Once you have this part dialed in as a small delta from like kind of a standard, like simple baseline starting point, go look at the mistakes and then let the mistakes guide you when you're doing future feature engineering. So your intuition, your experience in dealing with those sorts of problems in saying like, how do I make these techniques work better? Um, you can adapt things, you can do a little bit of invention around the margins, depending on how important things are. It can be a lot of fun. And then you just iterate and iterate and iterate along these lines. And then, when you're done iterating and you're like, I have a model I might consider deploying, evaluate on the test data and see if you're fooling yourself or if all of the work that you've been doing up here is the type of work that generalizes well to data that you weren't very intimately familiar with while you were doing the modeling process. And if the error rate on the test data is way, 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 way higher than the error rate on the validation set, you probably did something wrong. You're gonna to wanna to take a few steps back, unwind some of the stuff that you did, unwind some of the heuristics and the invention that you did and be like, ooh, I really overfit that validation set. I hyper-tuned towards the data I was looking at. So let's just unwind some of that work and see if we, uh, when it's unwound, we do a little bit better at generalizing to test data. And also, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about feature selection. And a feature selection would go like in like at this level or maybe after this level. We're going to get to that. And fe what feature selection, again, will do is it'll take like, hey, I got this gigantic bag of words. Let's do feature selection to pare it down to the 15 that matter the most, something along those lines. Wow, there's a lot of latency on that 15. Whew, that was a slow one. All right. Now. We've gone through text. I've spent, I don't know how long this lecture has been so far, 30, 40 something minutes, giving just like scratch the surface level understanding of what a professional would do with machine learning if they were gonna bump into a text problem. But I'll just say that there are a lot of subdomains of machine learning and each one of them have their set of techniques that I could talk just as long about and I'm not an expert in all of them. I mean, this is just like, like I said, scratch the surface level stuff. Um, in computer vision, you would do things like taking gradients, and we're actually gonna talk a little bit about computer vision, but you'd say like, hey, here's an image. Where is there a, a, a transition between a light part of the image and a dark part of the image? You take like histograms of how, you know, like process the image and how many pixels are brighter than this or darker than this. Convolutions is a slightly more advanced technique, which we're gonna talk about in detail. If you were working on internet, like anti-abuse things, you would have a whole bunch of standard techniques for normalizing IP addresses. So an IP address like 120 blah dot x dot y dot z, you might realize that you know a particular part of this IP range is all owned by a single entity or all registered by a single registrar. You could get that information just by going to a lookup table and finding it. Similarly with domains, you could say, well, what DNS server is hosting that? What other domains does that DNS server host? And you know, start to get into relationships of how the entities on the internet are related to each other, related to things that have been good in the bad or have been bad in the, ba in the past. And that gets into this notion of reputation, which is not just like, well, what is the identity, but what is the history of how that identity has behaved? How long have I known about it? What has it done in the past? How many different things that I have visibility into has it touched? Um, there's another area for time series where if you have like stock prices, there's a whole set of techniques about windowing statistics. Like let's look at particular statistics over the last hour, over the last day, over the last week, over the last month, that sort of stuff. Um, and then there's these notions of frequency domain transformations. If you've heard of the FFT, Fast Fourier Transform, which is commonly used in speech to turn a waveform which looks like this, um, you know, like at each, at each um, millisecond over the last, or, you know, like 44,000 times per second, you take a sample of what's the amplitude of the sound. And then, you know, this is the amplitude at each of those sample points. Well, you could take this type of thing and 
do a fast Fourier transform to transform it into something much more useful, which is to say, hey, that particular waveform is an A440, which is a particular, you know, um, 440, which is a particular like key on the piano, very like, bah, whatever that is. So you could say, hey, this these billion numbers are actually a particular pitch of sound, or you could say, hey, this is this particular wave series is a bunch of pitches that are in the human voice range or that aren't in the human voice range or things along those lines. And then in neural networks, there's basically blows the doors off of all this stuff. And one of the uh, things that people say about neural network is that with them, you don't need to do any feature engineering. The neural networks just figure it out, which is kind of like maybe at some abstract level, possibly partially true. But we'll see that there's really what happens is there's a whole nother way to think about creating the feature engineering layer in neural networks that moves it out of the kind of human intuition space into the modeling space, but then puts a lot of the human intuition in how you stitch the pieces of the neural network together itself. Anyway, that's just, and this is just four, there's many, many more we could go on and on and on. And you could legitimately do a full class of, you know, 10 three hour lectures on computer vision, on speech processing, on internet, pro I mean, you know, on neural networks for sure. So these are these are very deep fields. And in this course, we're just gonna see enough of this to get a sense of like, oh, that's a type of stuff that this type of practitioner would be doing. So a summary of feature engineering. Feature engineering converts the raw context or the unstructured data into inputs for machine learning algorithms. And there are some goals for feature engineering. One is that you wanna match the structure of the concept to the structure of the model representation. Or the way I said it in the past is like, expose the concept in the features. Don't hide the concept in the features. Create features that are very, you know, that have something to do with the concept that you're trying to model. But then at the same time, you wanna balance the number of features, the amount of data you have, the complexity of the concept, the amount of search you're gonna do. And we're gonna talk at length about overfitting and underfitting. And I just, you know, like, I know you don't know what those are, but when we get to those concepts, you're going to have this as a building block to click in and to understand, oh, I see what Jeff's getting at when we're talking about this or that. Every domain has its library, and I just talked about this, but, it, you know, they're, they're very complicated, and there's a lot of machine learning's power comes from these feature engineering libraries that thousands of practitioners have built up over many, many, many years. And in text, you know, some of the basic things you're going to want to talk about are normalization, tokenization, n-grams at the token level, but also at the character level, TFIDF, term frequency, inverse document frequency. You might talk about embeddings. You might talk about some natural language processing stuff and probably a bunch of other things that we didn't even get to today. And there you go. So thank you for watching this lecture and I'll see you next time.